everyone. I'm Cronus and welcome to season two of the Musicians Insider. We had a bit of a hiatus, but we're happy to say that we're back and I've got a lot of uh, really cool guests coming up. And today, none other than the amazing Alan Cross from Edge 102 and Q107. He also has his website, a journal of musical things.com and a journal of musical things. Well, the, Alan's been running the ongoing history of new music podcast for years um and how, how they describe it you know each week the podcast looks at something from the alt rock universe and from artist profiles to various thematic explorations whatever the episode you're definitely going to learn something that you might not find anywhere else and you can trust them on that so um with further ado here's alan cross welcome alan great to to meet you finally uh i've only you know talked to you over you know email and things like that and i really appreciate you taking the time today to to do this this is awesome i know how difficult it is to do a podcast so when everybody whenever anybody asks i i, I try to accommodate best i can well that's fantastic and you know uh, that'll come back to you uh tremendously yeah I that's believe. it it's, it's all about karma right yeah and also with the you know the way the internet works it's all about if you share you will get more it's kind of weird um but uh you know well you're also a staple in the industry like i i, I love the fact that growing up um i had a, a band in the 90s 98 90 or so called thermocline in ottawa canada mm -hmm. and we were on sony and we had a video fact and stuff and i was a guitar player but we had a um a very interesting group and then when that all ended i came back to toronto i remember like listening to you on the radio and hearing you on q 7 and loving your show and i thought that it was very inspiring to hear someone with a passion for the music and i've always wanted I, I remember then i was like oh i wish alan would talk about my new album that was coming out in 2005 and that never happened but uh i do very much appreciate that you played the 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 record on your show on your gem stuff but the reason I have you on today is the you Musicians Insider. This is my podcast about, you know, what can musicians do nowadays in today's day and age in 2022? What does Alan Cross have to say to musicians about what they should be doing or trying to do or in, or how can you inspire them? Because it's very frustrating right now and uh, labels aren't signing bands anymore. It's almost like you have to do all the work for the label just to get noticed. And then at that point, well, why do you need them? So like, you know, we're looking for advice for musicians and also just interesting stuff. Um, things like Spotify getting better resolution, things like that. I'm very interested in hearing what you have to say. All um, right, fire away. What's your first question? Well, um, for a new artist that has an album coming out, what would you recommend they do? And is there any time of the year that they should wait uh, first of all, make sure that you've got the right team in place. It's one thing to write the music and record the music. It's another thing to do the business side of things. So, you know, have a manager, have an agent, have a lawyer, uh, have an accountant, because 50% of the music business is the business. Ideally, the artist should be focused only on the art, and you should have other people that will take care of the business stuff. Now, it, you're saying, I can't afford that. Well, I, I tell you, I, I've got I've had too many personal experiences and too many experiences with other with bands who thought, well, I can't afford a lawyer or an accountant right now. So we'll just kind of stumble our way through it and we'll deal with all this later. We're just so happy to be acknowledged and signed. Well, that ends up costing them a lot of money later because contracts are really complicated and they've got a bunch of really nefari nefarious things in there. For example, um, there were bands that were being signed in, uh, you know, not that long ago. And in their contracts was still a clause for breakage. breakage. <laughs> you know, I've heard this. <laughs> yes. So, and that means CDs or vinyl that, that are damaged and that, you know, who is responsible for the payment or non-payment of royalties as a result of that. There is no breakage in the digital world, yet that's still there. And there's a bunch of little things that could creep into these boilerplate contracts that will come back and bite you on the ass if you don't have somebody you trust and somebody who knows what these uh, contracts contain will find for you and save your ass in in the in the long run. Uh, money that's important. You know, do you need to be incorporated? Do you need to have uh, a, a, an HST number? Do you need to? You know, what are you going to be writing off as a result of your business venture as a musician? 
Um, do you have an agent, somebody who is actually going to actively go out and find gigs for you? Um, do you have a manager who is going to look after your best interests? All these things, you know, I'm talking about ideal world situations, but you still need them. And, and at some level, you will still need them at some level. Um, on that note, I think it's interesting to say that I personally, you know, I don't want to get too much about, I want to talk about as your general artist, not just about me, but I spent a lot of effort getting a lot of those things in place, but I felt like, um, I would sort of go after the, like the best lawyer in the world, go after the best drummers to hire. Like I always kind of went for the shot for the moon on everything. And I kind of think I may have shot myself in the foot a bit sometimes by spending way too much money on things that were not as necessarily needed to be that done as they were more important of just to have them done inside the soup that you make, you know, like it's just, it's been rough because um, it, it's such an interesting industry. I think the, I think the thing you said the best was you have to focus on the art and I really want to get back, back to the art as the artist and that's right. important. Right. You, you need, not just good songs, but great songs. Everything starts with great songs. There are a hundred million songs available on Apple Music. There's 82 million songs available on Spotify. These songs go back to the very beginning of recorded music, and anyone can access any one of those songs with a couple of pokes at their phone. That's the competitive environment in which you're dealing right now and there's it's only going to get worse so that your thing as a musician should be how do i rise above the noise because the signal to noise ratio is has never been higher if we go back you know 20 years 25 years you know how many how many releases would there be in a given year you know 500,000 700,000 uh according to some people that i talked to in singapore last month a hundred thousand songs are being uploaded to streaming music platforms every, every day. hour every hour you know, it's, <laughs> it's every it's every day now there's some dispute there the number may be as low as twenty three thousand or as high as a hundred thousand but even if it's twenty three thousand let's just put that into perspective even the biggest record store back in the day would have a hundred thousand titles in stock now, one quarter of that is getting uploaded every single day at minimum to the streaming music services. So you um, uh, it's 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 an uphill climb. But to put it into perspective, it has always been an uphill climb because back in the day of, of CDs and records, uh, you had, like I say, maybe 500, 700,000 uh, releases a year. The um, the amount of competition to get to be among those 500 or 700,000 was insane. And it's, it's, I, I don't know if you can make them, you know, equal comparisons, but the competition to be heard has always been hard. The difference today is that distribution is easy. I mean, Who, you, who's the gatekeeper? That's it. There aren't any. That's, that's the, and that's the frustrating thing, because if you could make it past the gatekeepers, which in the old days were radio, record labels, record stores, and music magazines, and then a little bit later, the video channels, if you could get past any one of those, then you had a very good chance of actually becoming successful. Today, with streaming music services, everybody is their own gatekeeper. Every individual is their own gatekeeper. The stars that we have today are nowhere near as big as the stars as we had pre-internet. And today, um, there is no center to music. It's all these self-organizing and then self-destructing communities based around you know a song or um, a scene without really going too deep into individual artists, unless you're at the very top where you have you know, your Drakes and your Weekends and your Biebers and your Nicki Minaj's and your Cardi B's, you know, that's at the very, that's a very thin slice at the, at the, at the very top. For everybody else, it's all about individual songs from whatever era and from whatever genre. I have done some teaching at a community college. And one of the first things I did, I do is I ask everybody to pull out their phones and read me back the last 10 songs that they've played. Now, these people are between 20 and 25. So, you know, Typical would be, you know, Justin Bieber, The Weeknd, ACDC, uh, Depeche Mode, um, 
Led Zeppelin, the Beatles, Nicki Minaj. You know, so there's a tremendous uh, amount of ecumenicalism when it comes to music. People don't dis- they they you know back when 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 I was growing up, everybody was extremely tribal. You stuck with your genre, and you weren't weren't allowed to leave that genre. Now today, uh, and I'm going to use the word kids, and I'm going to do that advisedly because <laughs> neither are kids. Um, they don't care. They want a good song, and they don't care where it comes from, what age, what genre, or anything like that. Like the master of puppets thing with exactly, and and you know Kate Bush and and uh, running up that hill. Yeah. Uh, just today, I read that Fleetwood Mac is back on the charts. Uh, awesome with a song called Everywhere because they ended up in a in a Chevy commercial on TV. And the reason they ended up on a Chevy commercial on TV is because Christine McVie sold her rights to that particular song to some one of these big conglomerates who now have to get the money back uh, by licensing the song and finding new ways to ex- exploit that. So this is what you're dealing with. And so, oh, I'm painting a really bad picture here, but anyway, so, can, sorry, go ahead. Well, no, no, I'm thinking uh, earlier, we were talking a little bit about the, um, just the the things going on and uh one of my friends robert scoble i had him on the podcast he's a, a techie guy from yeah i know robert yeah okay so he he's really big on spatial audio right now yes and i had a really oh, interesting geez. talk with him he's on my podcast uh my first guest if you want to watch it sometime okay. and right. he, he, he talked happened. to me from his tesla but uh <laughs> what, what what do you think is it worth it for an artist that maybe just you know, blew all their money on their record and now they have to market it. Do they need to spend the money to make a spatial audio version of it right now before it comes out so they can get on the playlist and submit them or they're just going to get denied anyway? I understand the appeal of spatial audio and Dolby Atmos and all that sort of stuff. Um, Apple is making uh, a concerted effort to release as much material in spatial audio as they possibly can, because they think that that is a competitive advantage over Spotify, which has not done anything like that. The problem I have with spatial audio relates mostly to older music. When the Beatles recorded the White Album in 1968, they recorded it in four tracks uh, mono. And when that was finished, that's how the Beatles intended the White Album to sound. Now we're going back and peeling apart these records, these classic records that we've been listening to for 40, 50, 60 years, and we're applying new technology to them. They better let Paul sign off on that. Well, this is, and that's what I'm, I'm saying. They are messing. I mean, with, with the Beatles stuff, nothing gets happened unless Paul and uh, Olivia Harrison and Ringo Starr and Yoko Ono sign off on it. But what they're doing is they're changing, they're messing with the con- concept of beauty to us who have been listening to those of us who have been listening to these records since they came out we know what they what they sound like now you're making them sound different in a way the artist didn't want you necessarily to hear them maybe they do now but again it's it's changing um it's changing the base standard for how these records how these older records should sound you see what i'm saying yeah you're you're you're, mess, you're messing with history it's like colorizing a black and white film which is weird like right. chap, chaplain in color doesn't seem right it doesn't seem right you're right some people will feel this way now i've heard some uh spatial audio dolby atmos beetle stuff in fact i was invited to abbey road in, um back in 2019 and i heard a 64 channel uh version of of um uh, of abbey road in Studio 2 at Abbey Road that was created by Giles Martin. And it sounded fantastic. Um, but they're gonna, They'll get that right. They're going to get that right. But I, it, yeah, it just doesn't work across the board. Totally got it right. And the other thing, too, is that the Abbey Road was the first Beatles album to be uh, recorded in stereo. They used an eight-track machine to, to record that album. So to hear a Dolby Atmos type or a spatial audio type mix of that isn't as jarring. Because, well, we're already used to a, a nice stereo mix. But when you start messing with some older music, uh, I have a problem. Now, do you want to spend the money to have your music channeled that way as, as a new band? Good question. Only if you can afford it. That's, well, that's it, It's about 20, it's about 3,600 bucks American to do 10 uh, tracks. To do, 
Fifteen hundred bucks a day, three days. I'm talking to Jay Rustin actually about that. Do Do you think it's going to give you a competitive advantage? Over I have a... no idea. That's what I'm we, again, nobody does. N nobody does right now. I mean, Dolby yeah. Atmos and 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 spatial audio is like the half speed mastering of of 2022. Half speed mastering was when you uh, mastered a record by running the the tape, the master tape at half speed, and then speeding it up uh, after the record has been pressed. So it's you know supposedly um higher higher resolution less uh, hiss less background noise and all that sort of stuff and that was a really big thing for a while so maybe this is the 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 equivalent today i like some spatial audio stuff especially if i'm listening on a pair of really good headphones and it is a well produced record um you know it, would i listen to fugazi in in uh spatial audio don't really see the point <laughs> you know what are you doing to discover new music? I, uh, well, I do it, I, I, I do it professionally. So I'm sitting at my desk eight hours a day listening to music that comes through my inbox and following up with all my newsletters and finding out what's new and cool and what other people are listening to. And then I'm listening to a lot of foreign radio. For example, I'll spend uh, a lot of time listening to Six Music from the BBC. I'll listen to some Australian mus uh, radio stations. It's, it's fantastic to be able to sample radio from other parts of the world because uh, they do things differently. They play different things, and it exposes me to um, perhaps domestic or, or in, at least international um, music that I might never have heard. So that's what I do. I get about anywhere from 500 to 700 pitches for individual songs through my inbox every week. Yeah, so. you were saying that on on your show. Um, how do you keep it interesting? Really, is a question. I guess it's 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 music, so it's always the ongoing interesting stories of all the artists. Um, what about labels? Are they even a thing anymore as being discovered? Yes. Oh, I, I think so. There are certain labels that uh, if they release something, you want to pay attention because they seem to have exquisite taste. Domino Recordings from the UK, 30 Tigers from the US, um, Rough Trade from the UK. There's almost always, if something comes out on that label, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting. Um, Epitaph, if you're into that sort of thing, mostly, although they branched out from their punk, punk roots, um I, you know if it's on sub pop i'll listen to something on sub pop it's it's, it's kind of different because you know nobody watches television because you know nobody is a fan of cbs television you're a fan of individual tv shows that might end up being broadcast on cbs television but with uh record labels uh some of them have uh established a standard uh that you know 4ad another another great example um they have a sound they have an approach and uh Gour you gourmet gourmet audio <laughs> gourmet boutique you know creation records there's another one right. it comes out on creations like oh alan mcgee what's he got all right i'm gonna have a listen factory records back in the day same kind of thing so um yeah a label can certain labels do have cachet and you are going to have people who will check out something unfamiliar just because their favorite label has released it uh wax tracks something came out on wax tracks out of chicago um i guess it's interesting i guess to to say that there are those labels out there still like do people want to like i remember like it's like good to get in the pitch pitchfork it's good to have certain labels know about yeah. you but for so for radio you know, if you want to, like, I know I can go to the RDR music group. I can have someone submit my track digitally all across the, the country when it comes out. And we can hope that they're going to put it in their meeting at their program director. But like, is that still a thing? Like, I mean, do we want to invest in that? Like, because I think if you get on that radio, then what happens is my number one metric for all artists right now, I think you know this, is monthly Spotify listeners. Right right not individual streams how many people are coming in every month to listen to to your stuff and that is all that matters right now it seems and if you can make that happen you you win so well, radio you, would make that happen radio would definitely make that happen radio is still the fastest easiest and most efficient way of getting a song out to the general public the trick mm -hmm. is getting on the radio and in this day and age radio is going through all kinds of changes because of digital pressures uh, playlists are a lot tighter. There's a lot fewer radio stations that are are you know, doing you know new music. Um, are there but, guys like Bobby Gale left? Like he's yes. gone. Oh, no, no, no. There's there's lots. Um, I I I get 
these pitches I get are, are from radio pluggers. And there's a, a number of really good ones in Canada. Um, and they're kind of like record labels. So if I see one of these people uh, pitch me something, I'm going to pay attention because I trust the um, clients that they, t I trust their judgment when it comes to the clients that they take on. So I think you're right about having the team in place. Like I personally um, hired a label services team to help me release mine. Mm -hmm. And I feel that that is something that it, without the team and the release schedule and all the different things that have to then happen in the spreadsheet on a you know, like there's so much onboarding mm -hmm. that people don't realize from a digital marketing strategy. Right. And yeah. You, you just can't call TuneCore, have put it up and expect stuff to happen. No. And that's, something that like you know a lot of the artists are doing yeah and then like but but there is one thing TikTok can make it happen so you have to put it in a tune core and have it somewhere in order to make TikTok happen which can happen and TikTok is working and this is this is going to be a big deal TikTok is working at creating their own music streaming service right now if you are on TikTok and you hear a song in a video that you like you have to leave the app you have to go to Spotify or Apple Music, whatever, to hear the rest of that song. TikTok is owned by a Chinese company called ByteDance. ByteDance owns a streaming music service called Reso. Reso only operates in Brazil, India, and Indonesia. However, they are looking at expanding Reso's reach beyond those three territories. It may not be called Reso. It may be called TikTok Music. And if they're, they're currently in... Um, negotiations with the record labels, and if they manage to launch TikTok music, it will be a formidable challenger to all the established streaming music services. And right now, Canadians don't make money on TikTok the way the Americans do, and that's really sad because it's like, I go on, I see people on the lives and, and the supporting these really great communities. I found a guitar community on there. Uh, I went live the other night, and I ended up with 10,000 likes in one live. Wow. 347 people were in my live uh, individually, but mostly it was five or six people at once, but they're all hitting like the whole time for you because they're hmm. cool. They're being nice. You know, um, I, I've got very little experience with TikTok. I have a, I have an account, but I've never posted anything. I think you've just convinced me to do otherwise. Add me a uh, Cronus official and take a look at the live I did. I uploaded it um, on my, as a, one of the most latest ones. But, um, and yeah, what's your handle? We'll post that for everyone. To I don't even know. I think it's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> because I, I've got a guy helping me with this. And uh, if you need a guy, I'm, I can also be a guy like that. Uh, all right. Well, we, we may talk. Um, let me see if I can find it. And uh, also, this, this shows you exactly how much I've been paying attention to this. No, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to find, find all my login. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm dropping a record November 26th, the one that I was going to drop in July, and I was hoping, um, well, I'm, I mean, is there a suggestion on what, how I can pitch pitch it to Edge 102, or do I need a tracker? No, well, it, a, tracker's, a tracker is a good idea. I mean, there's a couple of ways. You, you find the person that you, there's, there's really not, the person to pitch is me. Right. I'm really the only one that's doing um so music new music curation right now is it out of bounds to say hey you know what uh, two years ago we did this record in la we came back here i started a podcast i went live every night during the pandemic like what kind of more dues do i need to pay to get you guys to play in my song <laughs> no that's 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 a that's a valid question what what you <laughs> What dues do I need to pay at this uh, point? Well, Have you, I paid them? <laughs> well, I mean, you've done all the groundwork. The trick is, and here's the problem with music, it's it's so subjective. And the public is fickle. And what you need is somebody on your side. Bruce Bradley, Slam and Media. We're releasing with them. It started today. Okay. If you've got to get, get them to do some radio plugging. See November 26. I yeah. mean, I mean, even if you get at this stage of, of your career, if you even get some feature play, that's great. Because that could be enough to to start moving things in the right direction. But how do we get like our hometown, like after moving to LA and doing things and coming back, how do we get Toronto to support us? Like I wanted to get Rock 95 Barry to support me, but I'd love to get, you know, Toronto to support me. Um, I are guess. You, are you playing gigs? Um, well, I tried to book the horseshoe and Craig basically said, you're not on the radio. 
<laughs> so it was, it was, ah. okay so so here's where we go with with getting an agent you the the, the fastest way Fel, feldman do i need feldman uh, well you need you need somebody CAA. you need somebody who's going to get you gigs on a regular basis because even if it's just opening slots for somebody because that's how you create word of mouth you know and that's where a manager comes in that's where an agent comes in Gotcha. Yeah, and you're right. You play play as much as you can, and I think after we release the album, we start playing gigs. We'll we'll see it start to blossom. Um, you know. Yes. Yeah. There there is no substitute, especially in this environment, for playing live, and having a group of strangers tell you the truth about your music in real time. That it's makes just, you. Better. The 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 thing I'm seeing is I have friends who do this. Is do I need to create a whole set of cover songs and play three sets at bars just to get my name out there and then drop an original when it's like all my originals have a weird style to them and I don't really want to be a cover band at all. Right. So it's like, I'm trying to skip that. Um, that used to be the way t- I haven't seen a band do that in quite some time. Now that's me. The hip, um, the hip are like the last band. Yeah, but, to that, do it. but that was like 1985. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so today I think people are looking, uh, realize that unless you're playing, you know, casinos or you're playing, you know, um, uh, you know, legions and 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 that kind of thing, where people demand familiar music from a from a live band. Uh, no, I mean, if, if you're a serious working musician, what you want to be able to do is showcase your stuff. Uh, the only thing that I have seen with bands is that they have taken a a cover and made it their own. Um, you know, maybe it's a weird. There was a band years ago from Calgary called uh, the Music, and. Uh, they they did a, a really good semi new metal version of um, a Madonna song. When Madonna music was the song, music. Like yeah, we, yeah, yeah. It was well, we, yeah. I think it was anyway. Um, and and that got them on the radio. Yep. Um, it didn't make them an awful lot of money, but it you know got them at least a little bit of attention. I think we did a gig with them with Biff Naked and D- David Wilcox and all possibly. Possibly. Sounds like the type of lineup. <laughs> well, that's cool. Um, let's see here. That thing about the Spotify getting better, is that soon? Is that happening? It is rumored that they will offer a platinum plan for nineteen ninety nine a month, which would be high resolution audio of some sort. Does that mean Dolby Atmos? Does that mean spatial audio? We don't know. But twenty bucks. At, 20 bucks. Better, better come with storage. Well, here's here's the problem is is Apple and Amazon are already offering higher resolution music, lossless music for the same. Well, for for much cheaper. And who wants to have that, you know, along with, you know, it's like Netflix and Disney Plus, like you don't want every service. No, no. So if if you are I actually conducted an online survey this past week, would you pay 20 bucks for better audio on Spotify and the resounding uh, answer was no like 63 percent of people who replied said no 20 bucks is a lot of money if you're okay with the audio that you're currently getting now remember that the last couple of generations have grown up on mp3s they don't know what full frequency audio sounds like they're perfectly happy with compressed audio so they've probably never even heard many of these people have never even heard a proper you know, 44 bit uh, sampling rate uh, recording because they've they've never had a CD player, and God, you know, they've never heard anything high res, which is 96 one and and beyond, uh, which you know sounds absolutely spectacular when you can actually hear the fingerprints of the guitarist moving up and down the uh, the strings, and it's it's just it's a trans. I mean, I grew up in the 70s where it was all about. Mm-hmm high fidelity you wanted speakers that were loud and clean and clear and accurate and not only did you want that in your bedroom you wanted it in your car now people are you know buying crappy skull candy earbuds and thinking yeah it's good enough or i'll listen through the the uh the um um what's that what are you holding oh these are my it's not they're not in there though these are my earbuds they're 64 audio they make in-ear monitors yeah two grand but they're molded and they have 12, yeah. dri- 12 drivers. I have uh, a, a number of uh, earbuds and, and headphones and one's called uh, one um, I more or one more. And they've got uh, little, little drivers that uh, have 
uh, or little little earbuds that have uh, four drivers in them, and they're great. I can't imagine what those sound like. I like these um, as well. These are my um, Audio Technica M50s. Yeah, I, I was at the Nam. You know the Nam show. Yeah. And uh, they had uh, this, this giant pair of these that people were putting on their head and taking picture with them, and I won it. So they gave me a three hundred dollar pair of these, and now I see, see them. I see these guys, but they're made in China or they're somewhere. These are the three hundred dollar really good Audio Technica M fifties. Mm -hmm. So I I like Sony MDRs. Uh, I've had those for for many many years, but if I want to listen to some serious music, I'll I've got some some Grados that I have. Um, Grados are are, are stupidly expensive uh audiophile headphones and they, yeah. they don't they don't work for for studio work or for for radio work they they work for serious listening are you a live concert person are you do you go to shows are i you... not as many as i used to but yes yeah okay i was just I, I have by the way a pair of molded earplugs right like the er15s or whatever like they bring it I, down. I went to a uh 20. an audiologist and just had it see them molded for me so they cut it like 20 dB or 15 dB. At least, and there's no overtones and no echo. So it makes all the difference in the world. And I enjoy shows much more than I used to back in the day when it was just blaring noise. When I got my first pair of in-ears, we did it in Toronto, and the people there apparently are the ones who had pawn or figured out the open mouth technique when you put your molds in. Oh, and, yeah. And they gave me the, the ones that were like just the earplugs that were also molded for when you want to go to shows. I'm a uh, sound ambassador for a hearing aid company called Widex. And I don't need hearing aids because my hearing is, I, I mean, I can hear like a bat. We can't stop here. This is bat country. But uh, my, my whole thing is talking to people about protecting your hearing, especially musicians, because you will lose your hearing if you don't look after your ears. So you'll appreciate this a lot, Alan. I went to hear well. Uh, it's a clinic here in yep. Midland, Canada, and I um I took my in ear monitor pack here, mm. and what this does is it transmits it into you know you just plug it in there, that's where that thing goes, and we put little tubes in my ears to measure the dB, mm. and we learned that turning this here to number four is where I can it's the highest I can go for it to be the right level of dBs that I won't be damaging my hearing. Right, and and this goes to ten. <laughs> so put it at four and then if you go any more than that you have less time that you can have it on because now you've you know and, and a lot of i know i spent the time to learn that because you know i don't want to have the hearing issues so i just thought you might appreciate that so. i i listen I, I i do um because if you can't hear you can't appreciate music and if you can't appreciate music maybe you can't make it anymore I, right. talk, to, talk to pete townsend about right. his hearing problems he's the very he's very tinnitus. open yeah yeah he's he's very well known for tinnitus I, i'm told it's tinnitus um, it doesn't seem right but toma tomato I, tomato yeah i guess so. i'm glad i don't know more about it i know way too much about it now <laughs> are you an are you um a musician do you play any instruments at all drums oh wow that's one thing i don't play yeah i uh i nice was given drums when we divided up the duties one day in high school and decided to form a band. So I got, uh, I got drums and then, uh, I took lessons and then I became a teacher. And then, and instead of being paid in cash for all this, not no students, I got paradiddle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Here, here's a 21 stroke paradiddle. Yeah. Um, I uh, took a credit at the drum store and bought pieces. And now in my basement, uh, I have a, um, an 11 piece double kick drum Tama set, just like Neil Peart played on the uh, moving pictures album um, stacked up on my basement. So, yeah. Uh, do you ever play it and make videos? Cause you really, really, it would be fantastic. It would be play. fun. Uh, no, that it drives the dogs nuts. And uh, it, it's, it's, I don't have quite enough room <laughs> because the square footage this, this kit takes up is, uh, is substantial. Well, that's great. Well, you I know, have, maybe I have, small, I'll, I have a small electronic kit that I. Well, I'll send you a link to the uh, drummer auditions when we have them. Um, okay. But uh, <laughs> but my my drum my friend Jack is a drummer that played on my stuff. He's a pretty amazing, and he's a drum teacher as well. So I respect the drum teacher aspect of things. Um, uh, it's interesting to know people who actually teach drums and watch how they do stuff with their students, and it, it's hard because like I'm a guitar nerd. Um, I'm with Ernie Ball. 
um, and I have the Petrucci Majesty guitar. I just love it, the black one. I was gonna have it here to show you, but it's I've, I've been cleaning things up. I'm also playing goat ends. I have a acoustic. Uh, I love I love these guys. I'm I'm really big on goat end. Hmm. They're a Canadian company, and I'm, I'm endorsed by both of them. They they've been helping me with getting things, but um, you know. Anyway, so um, I, I really appreciate you coming on and talking to me today, Alan. Um, I really, you know, it's nice to see someone who genuinely is passionate about music and, and cares and tells us things that we all want to know. Um, I can sense that you're as big of a Beatles fan as I was. Oh, up. boy. Yeah. Okay. Anybody who says the Beatles are overrated and and, and says that the Beatles uh, uh, aren't, aren't any, that they don't like the Beatles, they're not a music fan. And it was cool watching that new thing that came out. I haven't seen it all yet, actually. I'm still watching it. Oh, it's it. fantastic. Oh. That, with that part, just like, I, right at the beginning, I'm like, immediately, I'm like, no, Yoko did not break them up. She's just sitting there. She is just sitting there. I can honestly tell you, having spoken to a bunch of people involved with the Beatles, it, the band was going to break up. Um, and the thing that really broke up the band was a concert that John Lennon played in Toronto in September of 1969. It was the Toronto Rock and Roll Revival. And by a series of fluke circumstances, he put together a band overnight, which included Eric Clapton, by the way, and Alan White, the future drummer of Yes, um, brought them over to Toronto, played a whole bunch of standards, rock and roll standards, some new solo stuff and some Yoko stuff. And he had such a good time playing at Varsity Stadium in Toronto that he went back to the uh, UK and uh, about a week later, they had a band meeting, and John said, right, lads, uh, I want a divorce. And the rest of the guy said, yeah, okay, fine. Um, just, you know, we've got this this Abbey Road. No, we got Abbey Road is just is, is coming out. We've got the Let It Be album coming out in the new year. Uh, let's just keep it quiet, and then we'll then we'll just go our separate ways. But then in May of, of 1970, Paul McCartney uh, jumps the gun and, and quits first. Um, but actually, John had planned to leave the band in September of 1969, and it precipitated by this this uh, show in toronto i was such a beatles fan growing up but it's strange because i lived in toronto actually and my parents would tape beatles programs off the radio so i only listened to their hits mm. how strange is that and i actually learned about death when john lennon died and i was pretty upset but then my father and i don't know what year this was but might have been 81 or something my father took me to see beatlemania at the yes at the o'keefe center i saw it's about the same time too do you do you know what year that was i'm trying to track that it down. was okay uh, we go back beatlemania ran in the uk from 77 to 79 and they got sued by the beatles apparently. Uh, originally they did but then they worked out a a, a deal then they toured North America after that. So it would be 80 or 81. Yeah. I'm right. Okay, so it's 80 or 81. Because I think I lived yeah. in Toronto still. And I remember going to just, but they only let me see the first act before. And we had a spot on the aisle, like uh, at the O'Keefe Center. And I and I loved it. They did Strawberry Fields and stuff. So they, they basically did the, uh, the Red album. It was the amazing. Red, the Red Greatest Hits album. And then the second half was the Blue Greatest Hits album. And it was. It was really, really good. You got completely swept up, swept away in it. I'm glad you know that. That's that's good that we can connect on that. That's a really good thing. I think we can we can end on. I guess soon because it's you know it's almost about that time. Um, I I think uh, you know you, you, your time's very valuable, but I I do appreciate you coming on here, and I'd love to have you back again sometime, maybe to, to talk about something that's happening in the music industry or maybe uh, for season three. Um, I was thinking of doing season three of my podcast live, but I haven't gotten to that point yet. We can, I'll leave you with one thing. Um, you have to adjust your expectations when it comes to streaming versus sales. If you sold a million records, you would make a lot of money. If you have a million streams, big deal. Everything has, the the metrics for success have increased exponentially. Um here is what I'll say about a million streams. Yes, it sounds like a lot. However, let's put this into perspective. If you had a song on a very popular radio station and it was played four times in a day, you would have been heard by a million people. And what you would have been paid for those four streams is about, or those four airplay, uh, four uh, on-air plays is about the same that you would be paid 
for a million streams. You're right. And it's like nine cents each one. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's very little. So you need streams in the hundreds of millions if you're going to be making some serious money. Now, what you do, and this goes back to our conversation, is you do whatever you have to do to uh, cultivate your fan base and to have people coming back to your Spotify uh, playlist and increase that monthly listener count. It's not individual list. Well, you won't want to look at individual listeners, but you want to look at individual or the number of monthly listeners. And if you can, drill down to find out where, where? they are. This is why the Pixies play Mexico City so often, because for whatever reason, no one streams the Pixies more than Pixies fans in Mexico City. That's awesome. Thanks for having you on the uh, Musicians Insider. This uh, this has been great, Alan. Much much appreciated.